Molte grazie Presidente delle parole così gentili ed è la mia volta di ringraziare immensamente gli organizzatori e particolarmente il carissimo amico Alberto Piazza per aver organizzato questa riunione e avermi consentito di partecipare. Dunque, io senza altri preamboli, ha detto il Presidente che c'era un aspetto avventuroso e quanto nella vita di Luca, di cui parlerò tra un attimo, a me è piaciuto questo slogan, eh, eh, l'uomo che ha umanizzato la genetica umana, è un po' un pan eh, molto significativo ed è un, il filo conduttore di quello che voglio dirvi stamattina. Eh, il, eh, queste mappe eh, che eh, illustrano eh, in, in, in generale o in maggiore dettaglio eh, gli quelli che ho chiamato gli itinerari verosimili di Homo sapiens oramai sono noti a tutti, sono eh, non solo nel Scientific American ma anche nei libri delle scuole medie, per fortuna ho, ho, ho visto questo da, dai miei eh, eh, nipoti. E, eh, e naturalmente questo è semplificato. Una delle cose più interessanti di queste migrazioni è, è, che, è che sì, is out of Africa, il recent out of Africa ancora più recente, ma ci sono anche frecce di ritorno. E la cosa è molto più complicata di, di questa eh, visione generale, che a me serve solo come introduzione, because uh, the uh, fact that I think interested Luca from the beginning was that in this migration uh, human diversity was originated and the genetic drift and Darwinian selection were incredibly intertwined uh, and played a, 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 a major role at all times in this diversification. And that is why I chose that title uh, and I will conclude with human identity. So uh, how it all started for Luca uh, is uh, really, uh, to me, a great, one of the great lessons. Uh, uh, Luca Cavalli became professor of genetics in Parma uh, due to the vagaries uh, of uh, Italian uh, academic system, which I will not even begin to explore. Um, so you would say, okay, He, he is a man who wants to do the genetics of human population. What is he going to do in the province of Parma? And what he showed was that in the province of Parma, he could make major discoveries in genetics. This is the Parma River, uh, which uh, traverses the beautiful city of Parma and eventually ends in the Fiume Po. And he started to look at each individual village uh, along that valley And he, he had um, a number of uh, great intuitions. One of them was uh, to, uh, to look at the uh, parish registers because all the weddings were registered for the past several centuries. So when you say about the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church has done some very good things. And, uh, and uh, uh, while the evolution to looking at culture Uh, officially came much later. I think this betrays already from the beginning how he was trying to integrate uh, genetics and history and culture. And the results of this analysis were, uh, you, you, you might say, to be expected. Most weddings are in the same parish, and the weddings outside the parish are a monotonic function of the distance uh, between parishes. Uh, and uh, the, the um, uh, impact of genetic drift was very clear. Uh, the lower the population density, the greater impact of genetic drift. All this came from the analysis of the villages of the Valley of Parma. And it was consecrated because, uh, you know, already in those days I had learned that, you know, to publish an article in uh, Science or Nature is, 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 is difficult enough. But when you land into Scientific American, it means that it's already the digestion of the major, of the major articles that he was able to. So this article was 
1969, uh, and it was uh, about at that time that I had, uh, 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 at the time with my wife Paula, we were working in Ibadan, Nigeria, already for some years, and I got a letter which I couldn't believe my eyes because I was nobody. I was a young hematologist trying to, 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 to do some work in Ibadan, and I received a letter uh, signed by Professor Lu Luigi Luca, who was already a famous person, and he said he has to go to, to uh, Central African Republic, but he would like to make a detour and stop in Ibadan to visit. I couldn't believe my eyes. We were over the moon, and I will never forget that afternoon at our house when Luca with the entire team uh, came and had, uh, had lunch with us. Uh, so um, I, I, I'm very, I'm very, um, uh, yes, proud of that occasion with Paula. And um, and uh, in 1971, this fantastic uh, book was uh, published, uh, which uh, by uh, Luca Cavalli and Walter Bodmer. And uh, I'm very lucky to have the autograph. And I've already requested Walter to do the same because I want to paste it in that book. <laughs> And, uh, um, uh, well, uh, I, I'm sorry because it may appear that I have a conflict of interest because I have tremendous admiration and respect for, but I think without conflict of interest, that is the best book of uh, genetics of populations that was published before or after. And to me, it remains, well, one very clever th thing they did is they know about 10 times more mathematics. I like mathematics, but they know about two logs more. But what they've done is very clever. In the text, there is only the minimum that even I can understand, and then all the real mathematics is in the appendix. So it's a, also technically uh, 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 something I recommend to uh, all seniors and juniors. Uh, this, uh, only 2018, last year, uh, I had to write a review as a hematologist on a complicated um, condition called the plastic anemia. Uh, I will not bore you with that at all, except in table three, we made a major attempt with my colleague uh, Antonio Rizitano, that is to project population genetics uh, onto somatic cell genetics. And uh, we tried to show uh, the analogy between ho what happens in populations of organisms and what happens in population of somatic cells. And the two factors that uh, play a role are, again, genetic drift and selection. And the analogies, to me, are uh, proving more and more important to understanding human pathology. So, uh, you will forgive my, my kind of uh, um, uh, bias as a hematologist. If I show you an example of uh, genetic drift, which has to do with um, hematology. Um, uh, some years ago, uh, a, a, an excellent uh, Russian hematologist by the name of Yuri Tokarev, uh, he too was at our house in uh, London, and he discovered that in this part of the Volga Valley called Chuvasha, this, interestingly, they speak their own language, uh, there was a high frequency of a rather terrible disease uh, called polycythemia. Uh, and this was a congenital polycythemia. And here you can see the heterozygotes for this, here is a pedigree. The heterozygotes are essentially normal. They have normal hemoglobin level, about 16 is the uh, mode. Uh, but the homozygotes, they have a, a, a model level of 22 and some as high as 26. This is an absolutely uh, incredible and highly dangerous level of hemoglobin. And uh, here it just gives an idea of how uh, serious this disease is uh, associated with high mortality. Uh, and it is in this area, Chuvash uh, uh, of the Volga uh, Valley, and, um, of course, uh, they, it took some years to, not, to, to actually uh, find out the gene. Eventually, by beautiful tra traditional genetic analysis, by linkage uh, analysis, they mapped the gene to chromosome 3P25. And then, they, uh, uh, when the appropriate um, genetic markers were available, they mapped it and identified it with the gene um, von Hippel-Lindau, 
And uh, in fact, all the patients, all the patients were homozygous for this missense mutation in that gene. And this VHL gene, as many of you will know, uh, is involved in the oxygen sensing mechanism uh, that, uh, has, um, uh, that has produced a Nobel Prize for uh, Kelly um, Cement Ratcliffe only a few months ago. It is a fantastic physiological mechanism whereby when O2 is present, uh, then uh, VHL uh, takes care of degrading HIF1 alpha and therefore the uh, uh, renal epithelial cells that do this uh, know that there is enough oxygen. And uh, uh, when VHL is mutated, then that signal lacks. The, the, the cells still, there is still think that there is still hypoxia. They keep producing erythropoietin and the hemoglobin goes up by 50%. So it is a fantastic, a complex, dangerous disease, all due to this point mutation. And um, um, uh, to, to witness the effect of drift, needless to say, the fact that there was that high concentration in Chuvash must be a kind of founder effect in that population, which is rather isolated. But a few years later, um, Silverio Periotta in Naples discovered in the beautiful island of Ischia uh, that there were 14 cases of, Chuvash, of, of polycythemia that resembles Chuvash. So he went to look for the mutation and he found the same mutation in 14 people on the island of Ischia. Now, don't ask me uh, uh, which arrow goes from Chuvash to Ischia because I don't know. But this is uh, just one example of the many effects of genetic drift. Now, um, uh, as we all know, and we heard beautifully from Francesco, and uh, thank you for sharing with us about this uh, new site. Uh, and uh, <coughs> um, uh, uh, yes, he, he had this idea that um, hunters and gatherers are very different from agriculture. Agriculture took over because it is much more productive and it uh, enables people uh, to have more food and it increases, as a result of that, the population density by one or two logs or perhaps even more. And, uh, and uh, uh, so he had the idea, let us find which genes are more favorable to hunter and gatherers as opposed to agriculture. And therefore, we have to study the pygmies. Uh, and uh, I, in that respect, I will, uh, I will again have conflict of interest, but I must tell you, in Tanzania, there is everything. So in Tanzania, there are no pygmies, but there is a population of hunters and gatherers called the Hadza. And this is a, um, a Hadza hunter who is about to catch something very interesting. And uh, so it is not only the pygmies of Central Africa. There is still surviving population of hunters. And there is now evidence of genetic flow in both directions, from a Greek to hunters and vice versa. And uh, this is a recent paper which I found is not my field, but I, most of the things that I'm showing you are not my field except hematology. So forgive me if I, if I, if I say things that are not exact, but but I found this paper extremely interesting because I think Luca would have been very happy. Uh, in those days, um, the, the markers available were those polymorphic blood groups and uh, enzyme, polymorphic enzymes, which uh, only by luck could be involved in that selection. Now you can do genome-wide scans, and so they found genes where there is um, uh, evidence of selection what are called signatures of selection. And this is one example which I found very interesting. Here is uh, FST, which, uh, as, as, as most of you know, uh, is, a, is a sign of ancestry. And uh, it, this is the kind of background noise if you compare pygmies or, or hunters and gatherers in general with other populations. And here, suddenly, you see a mountain. And the mountain with high FST uh, corresponds to uh, several genes which they have identified. This is only one example on chromosome one. It is the obscuring gene, 
which I found very interesting because it belongs to a family of giant sarcomeric signal proteins, uh, and they have a role in the organization of myofibrids and interaction with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In brief, this gene is important in muscle, and the muscle for hunters and gatherers is undoubtedly very important. So it's a hint, it's a, it's a hunch, but it, it, it is, I think, an approach that could be. So, so I think Luca will be, in, because it's all very well to look at signals, but in the end, you want to understand mechanisms. And I think this is uh, the complement to, uh, so uh, African pygmies, I think he would be very, very happy to see that the idea um, uh, yielded benefit. Um, so uh, next I want to, sorry, go back to hematology because the sickle cell gene has been uh, for a long time a kind of prototype of Darwinian selection in human populations. And I don't have here to rehash the story that uh, for most of you is probably familiar. I couldn't resist showing you this because this slide was, uh, was uh, from my work uh, in Ibadan. So uh, that, that's, I mean, you can see that there, there, is, there is a little bit of, you know, it's, it's not a very clean slide, but it is because it's uh, about 62 years old. And uh, it still shows the essence of sickle cell anemia. The severe anemia, uh, the sickle cell, and the response of the marrow in the form of nuclear dead red cells. So the fact that there is a, a correlation in a geography between the distribution of the sickle gene and malaria um, has been highlighted many, many times. It is quite extraordinary because it is not only qualitative but quantitative if you look at Africa. And the other very interesting thing is the sickle gene is not confined to Africa. It is also found in the Arabian uh, Peninsula and in the Indian subcontinent. So much so that it has been widely speculated that the gene gives such an advantage that if it happens to occur by mutation, it will be selected. So it was postulated because of this distribution that at least five times, based on haplotype analysis of the sickle cell patients, that at least five times, so for, for years you will find even in textbooks that there are five haplotypes and five independent origins of the sickle cell gene. And it was JBS Holden, I think in this beautiful book of 1932, uh, who, who pinpointed that unlike epidemics that happen once, uh, powerful Darwinian selection would be a prerogative of disease that have a high kill rate, kill in pre-reproductive age, ob for obvious reasons, then you can't pass on the genes, and continued over several generations, otherwise you wouldn't get really selection. And of course, malaria ominously uh, fulfills all these criteria. So, I'm going back to Tanzania. Tanzania is one of the countries which unfortunately has the uh, highest, I think in the world, uh, one of the five or six top countries in terms of uh, births and uh, frequency of uh, patients with sickle cell anemia. And I pay tribute to Julie uh, McCanny, uh, my colleague uh, there, who has masterminded a fantastic program uh, uh, mapping, the, mapping the geography and then setting up a, a center for the longitudinal study and the clinical care of uh, these patients. Uh, and um, um, my interest in this went back again to the question of understanding mechanisms. And uh, uh, now it is the 50th anniversary of this paper. And so what we did was very simple. We took patients who were AS heterozygous and who did have malaria, and we asked a very simple question. If we gradually um, undergo sickling, uh, which cells will sickle first? And we found a very clear answer. It is the parasitized cells that sickle first. And that signal a very kind of obvious potential mechanism whereby if the cells sickle, they are conspicuous in the body. Uh, similar results have been obtained in vitro very, very recently by this beautiful work of Virginia uh, Archer, 
in which he showed how strictly the growth in vitro of PFAS superon depends on oxygen tension. So the lower the oxygen tension, the lower the growth. And here I'd like to uh, pay tribute uh, to work that was done in Torino with the cell cultures uh, by Paolo Arese's group, in which they uh, beautifully uh, um, demonstrated that cells that are parasitized sickle early and at the early stage of parasitization, the so-called ring forms, uh, the cells become loaded with IgG and complement and prey to macrophages. So the real mechanism most likely is the preferential phagocytosis of AS parasitized cells as opposed to the so-called normal cells. And this is summarized here. Uh, in a normal case, uh, uh, the, this parasite cycle goes on, and at each cycle there is a, I, I, it is mind-boggling. When we think of bacteria growing by the power of two, but Plasmodium falciparum growing by the power of 20. And, uh, and uh, uh, if the cell is AS, it will sickle early on, it will be phagocytosed by uh, macrophages. And that, of course, uh, well, here you can see a macrophage already has evidence of having phagocytosis, so-called malaria pigment, and yet it is able to still phagocytose more. And as usual, scientists have been always anticipated by poets because this very thing was described in Inferno where it says uh, of, of somebody else, e dopo il pasto, a più fame che pria. As you know, it is in the first canto of the Inferno. So um, sickle cell, we know the mechanism. And for any other gene where we claim Darwinian selection, eventually we have to find the mechanism. So um, two more things I want to tell you about the sickle because I think it's quite fantastic. This one, because it's highly sophisticated genetic uh, work, um, uh, um, pioneered and, and brought uh, to completion by a Nigerian uh, geneticist uh, called Rotimi. And um, what they've done is they have um, fully sequenced more than 1,000 people with sickle cell, and they've used all the uh, available uh, databases of the Human Genome Project. And they have tried to make sense of the five haplotypes, which are shown here, Benin, Senegal, uh, CAR, Central African Republic, uh, Cameroon, Arabia, Arabian Indian. And they were able to construct a pedigree uh, or evolutionary tree or network that covers all of them. And, the fi and, and, and this would be the ancestor of all those haplotypes. And the final conclusion of this work is that most likely, uh, you, at least you can justify the present distribution by a single event, not five mutations, but just one. I think it's a very, very intriguing and also a very good lesson that anything we say about evolution is always the best fit because, because unlike experimental science, we have to, uh, be aware of the obvious thing that we were not there. So we can't do the experiment. Evolutionary genetics is based on always trying to find the best fit, the most economical uh, explanation. The last point about the sickle cell, and then I will move on, Mr. Chairman, is that, that we heard a lot about the notion that evolutionary um, phenomenon are part of human history and prehistory. But what of today? Does it have anything to do with today? And uh, this work, uh, uh, masterminded by the famous geneticist Ayala, uh, was a very detailed analysis of the S gene prevalence in the Republic of Gabon, here, uh, correlated to malaria. So here you can see in red, high malaria, in yellow, less malaria. Still malaria, but less malaria. And here you can see the S gene, and you can see on a, what I call a micromapping scale the correlation between the two. And when they uh, try to quantitate this, here are the SCT sickle cell trait prevalence, malaria prevalence. You see a monotonic relationship, and this is today's population. So today in Gabon, there is evidence that selection for the S gene is still ongoing. 
I think this is very, very important. So um, going back to genetic drift, one of the things that I don't, uh, I, I'm a total uh, uh, admirer, but I don't understand, is we heard about speciation. We heard yesterday, and we will probably hear again today. So speciation, classically, Telmo Vrevani gave us a beautiful hints of how it works, and usually it is allopatric. Usually uh, a group migrates, and uh, uh, if it's successful, uh, it may not just build a colony, but a new species. So I'm sorry, I'm of course very, very biased towards Tanganyika, uh, which is part of Tanzania. And this is the incredible uh, picture uh, of cyclid fish evolution in the Lake Tanganyika. And uh, this has become, uh, well, apart from being a very beautiful fish, incidentally, they're also very good fish, uh, but, but, it became a model in which um, Henning and Meyer, uh, um, uh, Meyer usual, uh, recently recipient of a major prize for this work, um, mating preference, cure for non-random mating, target of natural selection, those are the factors that allow this incredible phenomenon, which is sympatric speciation. So uh, another very intriguing thing. Now, in human population, I don't know if you have noticed, it has not happened. So, um, uh, so I come to my last point, that is human identity. And uh, uh, here I'm on, uh, on, 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 on dangerous ground because it's not my field. But I thought it was challenging to relate it to what I've been saying until now. And uh, yes, um, uh, Luca wanted to catalog humanity uh, in his own way. And if... You, you, you analyze identity. I thought there are obviously three different levels, maybe even more, but we can distinguish three. One is the species identity, uh, quite obvious. I'm human. Umani nil me alienum puto. So very, very old concept that there is something human about every one of us. The group identity, I'm from Genova. I belong to this club of those who are very, not me, of course, but uh, me. And uh, Harvard, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Brahman, I'm a Genoa fan, a Manchester United fan, and uh, I'm a hematologist. So each one of these, and people tend to identify to one type of group or another type of group. This is purely uh, a, a choice. And finally, there is individual identity. So in my last few minutes, I'd like to analyze these three things. The species identity is by now epitomized by this very popular cartoon. And uh, um, Luca would never have indulged in something so, uh, so um, kind of uh, uh, easy. But uh, with Francesco, they did something much more sophisticated in this book, in which they do confront the issue of uh, 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 human diversity, but also of uh, human uh, identity. And um, uh, this has to do with the primate evolution, which Telmo has already taken us through. I think this is one of the most uh, recent uh, phylogenetic trees uh, in which uh, the bonobo come out as uh, uh, possibly our, um, one of our uh, closest relatives. I've seen the bonobo colony in um, very near Kinshasa in Congo. Uh, it, it is quite amazing. Apart from, uh, from all their features, uh, the fact that unfortunately some of these bonobo babies uh, are orphans because their parents have been killed either by poachers or by accidents. And now they have uh, human uh, nurses that bring up these baby bonobos. Absolutely amazing and very highly civilized on behalf of the Congo Republic to have set up this colony. And so uh, one obvious question that I think is in everybody's mind sooner or later is w w are we really different in which way? What has caused this difference? And the fairly obvious um, 
answer, not part of the answer, it must be the human brain. So everybody knows that the human brain is big, uh, in fossil analysis, um, uh, cranial size is always one of the things that is discussed uh, to try to classify. And here are the brains of uh, many mammals. And of course, the human brain stands out. Um, I always find that, you know, just to put it into perspective and to be a bit humble, uh, actually the elephant brain is bigger than the human brain. So obviously it is not just the size. It, it must be also the, the, size, the, the, the way it functions and in other words, the connections. However, the number of neurons I think is very important and here um, are some uh, figures that probably you know. Uh, the human brain, they, they, they always quoted Wikipedia, look everybody, it says there are 100 billion neurons. So this um, a, 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 a Brazilian researcher uh, was a very, um, sorry I'm doing something wrong, yes, uh, I'm completely off now, um, but it, yes, so she was fed up with reading this 100 billion, so what she did is she, count, she counted them. She set up a very good technique and she found, no, it's not 100, it is 86. So actually the guess had been pretty close. So that figure, to me, I always tell the students, you don't have to remember many things, uh, you can look them up in the book. There are two things you must remember. One is that in the human genome there are 3.5 times 10 to the 9 nucleotides and the other is there are 86 times 10 to the 9 in the uh, human brain. And uh, now, of course, I go back to Tanzania because that is where it all started, believe it or not. That was where humans, probably the first homo sapiens, were. And the famous Olduvai Gorge, and this is the famous Twiggy, uh, not homo sapiens, homo habilis, um, uh, very, very important uh, landmark that uh, I'm not competent at and don't have time to go into. These are the cladograms representing evolutionary history, but, but the real question is, what has, what has caused the, the jump? What has caused the jump that has made this brain uh, uh, bigger and more neurons and more interesting? And uh, uh, we don't know yet, but there is very recent work, which I think is extremely interesting because for all our pride that we know there are now 22,376 uh, uh, protein encoding genes in the human genome, most of the genome, as you know very well, is not coding. And, and, and that part is still not very well known and there are lots of repeats. And so one idea they had is let's look at the insertion which different between the uh, other primates and humans. And they found very interesting data by looking at these insertions. And one of the uh, genes that came up was NOTCH. NOTCH2 has a duplication uh, in humans which is not found in other primates. And it could be that the presence of this duplicated gene causes for a few days continuous neuronal replication when it doesn't in the primates. Now it's quite obvious that having that gene active for a few more days in embryonic life can very easily double or even more the number of neurons in the brain. Now it's, I'm sure it's not as simple as that, but it is, I think, a, a challenging model because it's a testable model. And, uh, and uh, I think uh, I, I point you uh, to this a very uh, good review in Bizzotto and Walsh uh, that picks up two other papers in which these, and there are even more recent um, derivatives of that. So that is as far as uh, human species identity is concerned, and I think there is little doubt that species identity is determined by the human genome. When we come to um, group identity, which I've already mentioned, uh, the thing is rather different. Um, this is a book which I have at home, the last book on um, uh, races by a very distinguished anthropologist, uh, Renato Blasutti. And um, uh, the, that point, at that time, the identity of the group was often identified with race. And 
we've already heard uh, from Telma and others, and we will hear more, I'm sure, from Professor Berbuyani about the question of um, uh, race and no race. I, I was very proud that just before that visit by Cavalli in uh, Ibadan, uh, I had been asked to give a lecture on, uh, on the concept of race in 1966, of which I still have the slides. And I was very proud that I came to the same conclusion. Uh, and uh, the concept of race has no scientific basis. It should have no uh, uh, right of abode in scientific papers. I still receive questionnaire from uh, learned societies, I will not mention name which, which says um, race. Uh, so I send it back and said, I, I don't know exactly what you mean, but if you give me instructions. And they've changed the form now. So why in, 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 in dogs? The concept of race is perfectly all right. Uh, races of dogs. Uh, you will recognize San Bernardo and the Greyhound and the others, which I always forget. And well, of course, they've, they've, they've recrossed brothers and sisters for generations. So artificially, you can make race. This has not happened. Fortunately, even in the most dire situations of conflicts of human population, this has not happened. And uh, so the antithesis of the four volumes of Blasutti is this fantastic book, which I call the Encyclopedia, the first and last encyclopedia of the human genetics. Oh, here I have the um, autograph of both uh, Alberto and Luca, and so I've requested Professor Menozzi to get it so I can paste it in the book. And uh, I think uh, they, uh, th th this is an illustration from the uh, National Geographic, uh, which shows both the difference in genetics and in culture uh, that you find. And I will not go into the arguments um, that, uh, that uh, Luca very carefully elaborated of the uh, non-validity of the concept of race based on the various algorithms and the various um, distance relationship. Uh, but I will add what was his conclusion because it's very pragmatic. Let's forget about the science and about the rigorous demonstration of that the concept is working or not. Per la specie umana il concetto di razza non è utile. Dunque lasciamolo da parte. Now, of course, the fact that it is non utile is, is not shared by some politicians. They think it can be very useful. But that, of course, is another reason why we should uh, stand up. So, um, going back to Tanzania as usual, uh, what is, the, uh, I, I, I will not discuss skin pigmentation, but I, I do mention it because one of the obvious arguments when race is discussed is the fact that, oh, but I met somebody in the street and it's obvious that he is from Africa. So why do you tell me that the concept of race has no happened? So I don't have to this audience to explain where that ambiguity or misunderstanding comes. But color is important. And the question is, what was the original color? Those homo sapiens in the Olduvai Gorge, what color were they? And very interestingly, we don't know. Uh, it's possible from the gene frequency of a number of pigmentation genes that I think uh, you will tell us something about. Um, uh, it is possible to make some guesses, but the fact is we don't know. Well, my idea is that probably they were not as dark as Tanzania today. I think they were probably, um, you can see very, very interesting that the distribution of skin pigmentation, this is Botswana, much, much uh, less pigmentation than today in Ethiopia or in Obotic Ethiopia, where they're very, very dark but there is a wide distribution, and this is still visible in Tanzania, and I think that the original were somewhere here, and that selection has favored less pigment in people who migrated to certain areas, and more pigment in people who migrated elsewhere. So, so group identity depends on awareness as well as on objective facts, and I think it is based more on culture than on genes. When it comes to individual identity, then we have to, uh, well, I'm on very dangerous grounds because it's an extremely difficult question on which, on which psychologists and poets and 
uh, and many writers and philosophers have really delved into what is human identity. So I will not even have the audacity to start. But I'm considering those figures that I told you before. And if there are 8.6, 10 to the 10 neurons, it is estimated there are at least 10 to the 12 connections. So the way the identity works must depend on those connections. And uh, how are those connections formed? Certainly, there is a mastermind, there is a plan. There is a, there is a, I always tell the students that the cell is a little bit like a very, so, like making a cell is a bit like making a Ferrari. Very, very complicated and very sophisticated and very beautiful. The only difference is that the Ferrari does not have in itself a template to make another Ferrari, whereas the cell does. So, so that, that plan for the connections, but a lot of the connections must be uh, influenced by the environment, we have evidence of that, and stochastic phenomena, uh, because, because, because they are uh, physical entities and they're subject to the laws of quantum mechanics. Just like mutation, spontaneous mutations are due to uh, stochastic events, probably also some of the connections. So how do, yes, yes, five minutes. Uh, and uh, how do we check identity? Three minutes, okay. Um, so, so how do you check for identity? I think one test is identical twins because, uh, because they have the same genome. And, uh, and uh, uh, here are some examples. And uh, this um, study has looked at uh, mutations in twins and has discovered, not surprisingly, that there are a few somatic mutations. So in fact, due to somatic mutations, the genome of two twins already at birth are not absolutely identical. Plus the fact that, of course, there are major epigenetic differences. And as the twins grow, the epigenetic differences increase. So if I have to summarize, uh, given the large number of nucleotides, there are somatic mutations. Given the large number of connections, there are stochastic chains that may be uh, rare, but with absolute numbers being large, they may carry significant weight. And therefore, I think that individual identity is in the realm of psychology. It is found in the person genome, centered in the person brain, with substantial input from the environment uh, due to the mechanism that I have just mentioned. And so with that, I would like to thank very much uh, all of you. I have not had a chance to mention this fantastic room, so I hope somebody will take a picture because it's a great honor to be speaking in the Sala dei Mappamondi. I'm sure everybody is concentrating your attention on Tanzania in this <laughs> Mappamondo, uh, and uh, particularly uh, to um, Luca Cavalli Sforza and to his wonderful family. Thank you. Ringrazio il professor Lucio Luzzatto.